All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video for, for numbers and sets. Admittedly, it's been a little while since I've, I've last made a video, right? Kind of messed up my shoulder for a little bit and it was, I was in a lot, of, a lot of pain. I couldn't really move it a whole lot initially, but as you can see, I can move it now and even though it's not 100%, I can at least kind of move it around uh, to a point where I'm pain-free. Uh, or, or mostly pain-free, I should say. So that's, that's always a good thing, right? Because that means we can go back to making math videos comfortably. So uh, just to recap what we have been doing so far and kind of to try to motivate this, this upcoming video, we have been talking about division, the, the concept of division. And one of the first ideas that we introduced when talking about division is what it means for one number, which we'll call A, to be a factor of another number B, right? And we said that if A was a factor of B, then there's going to be some integer, which maybe I'll call C. It's gonna be some integer C such that, all right, S dot T for such that, b is equal to a times c. In other words, b is an integer multiple of a, right? So this is what we, we use as our definition for what it meant for one number to be a factor of another. And, and we've been looking at a couple different examples of factors of numbers. And maybe if I wanted to, for example, just look at the positive factors of the number 18. So I'll say positive factors of 18. We could list those out, right? Where we would have one, two, three, six, nine, and 18. And after looking at some of the, the positive factors of a number, we also kind of took a little bit deeper of a look and started to classify different factors of a, of a number. So first thing to note when looking at factors of a number, such as 18, is that every number is guaranteed to have at least two positive factors. Uh, the first being the number one, and the second being the number itself. So if we're looking at factors of 18, uh, 18 is also guaranteed to be a factor. Then we have all of the, the factors that were not the number one or the number itself, all of these guys, which in this case is two, three, six, and nine, and we call these factors proper factors. So these were the proper factors of 18. And while the underlying factors being the number one and the number itself, while those are guaranteed to be factors of a number, the proper factors were, were not. Some numbers may have proper factors and some numbers don't. And the, the, the reason this is sort of motivation for, for this upcoming video is because in this video, we are going to be looking at a class of numbers that says we do not have any proper factors. In other words, the only positive factors of this specific class of numbers are these underlying ones, being the number one and the number itself. And if, in case we're not already familiar with what those are, you might want to check the, the title of the video and that might give you a hint. Uh, these types of numbers are called prime numbers. Okay. And what we're going to be doing in this video is first, I guess, properly defining what a prime number is, which is mostly what we just mentioned, uh, but, but really just writing out the full definition for what it means to be a prime number, and then to prove a couple of interesting, or what I think are really interesting statements about prime numbers. Okay, so that's going to be the, the plan for, for this video. So uh, hopefully that makes sense. First things first, we should write out the definition of a prime number. If we're going to talk about prime numbers, which we're going to be doing in this video and the, the upcoming one, we should probably define what it means for a number to be prime. So I'm going to write out the definition of a prime number right here, and then we'll, we'll unpack it. All right, so we've written out the definition for what it means to be a prime number right here. Let's go through that definition together. So it says that a natural number P is a prime number if P is greater than one and the only integer factors of P are plus minus one and plus minus P. 
Okay, so this is the, the full definition of what it means to be a prime number. Now, typically when people think of the definition of a prime number, they're gonna think of this last part of the definition right here, that the only positive factors of a prime number are the number one and the number itself. Uh, however, if that is the only criteria that you base prime numbers off of, you can sort of pose this interesting question of what about the number one? Is the number one a prime number? And that after all, we could, we could write the number one as one times one. This is, this is allowed, of course, right? And by doing this, we would say, okay, the number one is a factor. So that condition would be satisfied. And also the number itself, which just happens to be the number one, is also a factor. So both of these conditions would be satisfied. And it seems that if, if this was the only part of the definition for what it means to be prime, then the number one would be a prime number. However, there is this other component to the definition that sometimes people don't quite remember, which is that prime numbers are def defined to be strictly greater than the number one. And because of this part of the definition right here, that eliminates P, or that eliminates the number one, I should say, from possibly being a prime number. Why? Because uh, it, it says so right here in the definition. So the answer to the question, is the number one a prime number, is no. The number one is not prime. So that is something to, to keep in mind. Okay, but, but hopefully that makes sense, that this is the definition right here. What I want to do now is I want to start to look at some really interesting results that can be established from prime numbers. And the first result that I want to look at is a theorem. So let's write that out, theorem, which states that any natural number that we have that is greater than one, any natural number greater than one can be written as a product of prime numbers. In other words, we can decompose any number as a product of prime numbers. So let's write that out first, and then we're going to go through the semi-formal, or by semi, I mean not, not very formal proof for, for that theorem. Okay, so let's go through proving, or somewhat proving this statement. Let's say that we have some natural number n, and we wanna show that this natural number n can be written as a product of prime numbers. Well, because the natural number n has at least two factors, because every number has at least the two trivial factors, right? Then we can always write this natural number Maybe I'll write it over here. We can always write this natural number as a product of two numbers, A and B. And these numbers can either be prime or they can not be prime. They, they can fall into one of those two classes. And for example, maybe let's just say that the number A happens to be prime and the number B happens to not be prime, just to keep it very general. In that case, uh, we see that n is written as a product, but only one of the two numbers are prime and the other is not. So how do we show then that uh, it, this number n can be completely written as a product of nothing but prime numbers? Well, if b is not a prime number, that means that it has additional proper factors besides the number b and the number one. So we could write b, or we can decompose b, into a further product of its proper factors. So we could say that maybe b is equal to another product of two smaller numbers, c times d. And by plugging this back in, then we would get that n equals a times b, which is c times d. And then we would just uh, go number by number to see if, if each of these are prime. 
And if the number is prime, then we would say that's great. That is good for our product of primes. And if the number is not prime, that means that we can always then decompose it into a, a product of its proper factors. And because those proper factors are getting continually smaller, we are eventually going to reach a, a product that consists of nothing but prime numbers for any natural number. Uh, okay, so, so that is sort of the, I realized I, I didn't even write much of anything. I almost just verbally explained why any number can be uh, written as a product of primes. But hopefully that makes sense. Now, for, for the people that have, have taken math classes before, they might say, how come you're not using this thing called induction to, to prove this statement? And uh, induction is, is really this mathematical technique that we just haven't covered yet. We're going to get to it in this video series. But because we haven't dealt with it yet, uh, we can't formally use it to, to, I guess, rigorously solve these types of problems. But just know there is a thing called induction that can help make these proofs uh, a little bit more concrete. Okay, but, but hopefully we get the, the main idea. I think what I want to do is just to go through an example to, to sort of see how this process works and that might help solidify some of these ideas. So for example, maybe I'll write over here example. Let's take the, the number 36. And we want to see is the number 36 a, or, or how can we write the number 36 as a product of prime numbers? And the, what we could first do is we could say, okay, 36 itself is not prime. So it, it can be decomposed into maybe three times 12. Three times 12 is 36, right? Now, looking at this product, we would then ask, okay, is every number in this product a prime number? The number three is prime. So that sort of, check, we can check that off our list by saying that is a prime number. But the number 12 is not a prime number. So the number 12 is preventing us from, at least up until this point, from writing 36 completely as a product of primes. But according to uh, some of the ideas in this very informal proof, uh, if 12 is not prime, it can be further decomposed into its proper factors. So then we say, okay, let's take a look at the number that's not prime. Let's take a look at 12. And 12 can be decomposed as 2 times 6. That's one way to decompose 12. So if we were to just substitute this back in uh, for our product right here, now we would say that, maybe let me just write it over here, that 12 equals 2 times 6. So now we can substitute that back in and say that 36 is equal to three times 12, which is this product, three times two times six. And then we just kind of apply the same process. We go number by number and say, is it prime or is it not prime? And the, the number three is prime, so that's good. Number two is prime, so that's good. The number six, unfortunately, is not prime. So, so six is what's preventing this entire product of being a prime, or a product of primes, I should say. Uh, but again, because six is not prime, that means it has proper factors, factors in between the number one and the number six. And more specifically, we know that six equals two times three. So now if we plug this back into here, now the number 36, can be written as three times two times six, which is two times three. And now hopefully we see that, that by looking at the number 36, three is a prime, two is a prime, two is a prime, and three is a prime. So we have written the number 36 as a product of numbers where each of the numbers in the product are a prime number. And that's what the, the theorem is, is stating. So hopefully that makes sense. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to erase the board and then we're going to look at another really, at least what I think is an interesting result regarding prime numbers. So let's do that now. All right, 
So we have just shown that any number can be decomposed as a product of primes. Now we're gonna move on to the next interesting result involving prime numbers, which this one's gonna take a look at how many prime numbers are there in existence. And you could probably read what the, the theorem states, right? But this theorem is, is, is telling us that there are infinitely many prime numbers out there in existence. Right. And it's our job to, to show that that is the case. So, so kind of an interesting idea, how many prime numbers are out there? Infinitely many. Uh, so so how, do, how do we show this? Right? That's probably the, the million dollar question. And what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna show two different proofs. I'll explain why we'll show two different proofs when we get to the second one. But the, the first proof is going to be, uh, or was created by some guy named Euclid and I think we have seen this guy, Euclid. This is the, the same guy from Euclid's algorithm. And he was able to, to come up with a proof to show that there are infinitely many prime numbers. All right, and I'm just gonna warn you, again, there are gonna be a lot of steps to this, but rather than uh, maybe trying to take all of it in at once, if, if that is too challenging, I'd recommend just, just pausing the video going step by step by step to make sure each individual step makes sense. And hopefully each individual step isn't so bad and that will lead up through the entire proof. Okay, so uh, anyways, let's, let's get into it. Uh, what, what Euclid does is, is he performs a proof by contradiction where he says that rather than assuming there are infinitely many primes, let's assume there are only finitely many primes. So he starts by saying, let's assume that there are only finitely or a finite number of primes. And maybe if, if we have a finite number, we can label each of them. So we can say there's P1, P2, all the way through Pn. Maybe there are n total primes in existence. And of course, the goal is to show that there's a contradiction when, when uh, introducing this assumption. Right? So if there are only n different primes in existence, we can come up, or we can define another number constructed from each of these primes. And we can call that number whatever we want. I'll call it M, just because why not? I don't know. And, and this number M is going to be the product of all of the N prime numbers in existence. So P1 times P2 times P3, all the way through P sub N. So the product of the N primes plus the number one. And that plus one is going to be important. Okay. Um, so all, all we've done so far is to define this number n. Now, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a claim, and, and this is going to be sort of this intermediate result that we're going to need to verify before uh, continuing with the rest of the problem. And this intermediate claim is that out of these n prime numbers, not a single one of these prime numbers is able to divide the number m. Another way of writing this is that for all values of j, the prime number p sub j, the jth prime number, whether j is 1, 2, 3, or whatever, all the way through n, p sub j does not divide the number m. Okay. Now we need to show this. And the way that we'll show this is, again, a proof by contradiction. So uh, to, maybe what I'll do is I'll say to show this, we're going to assume the opposite. So let's actually instead assume that there is some prime number in out of these n. We'll call it the jth one. There is some prime number which does divide m. We'll make that assumption. We also know that the jth prime number, also we know that p sub j divides the product of each of these n prime numbers. We have p sub one times p sub two times p sub three times p sub n. And we, we know this to be true, right? Hopefully this makes sense because if this contains all of the prime numbers, that it's going to include p sub j somewhere in this product. So we're gonna have p sub j multiplied by every other number. In other words, a p, this product is an integer multiple of p sub j. 
Hopefully that, that makes sense. So we have these two facts right here, that P sub J divides M and it divides the product of all primes. And what we've learned in previous videos is that if P sub J divides one thing and it also divides another thing, therefore it will also divide all possible linear combinations of these two things right here. So in other words, if, if this is true, that implies then that P sub J will divide some, uh, some number A of our first quantity plus some number B of our second quantity. So P1, P2, all the way through Pn, okay? What we can do is we can set A to equal one and B to equal minus one because P sub J should divide any linear combination. And in the case where A is one and B is minus one, this expression simplifies to M minus the product. Another way of writing this is that P sub J divides not M, or rather than writing M, I should say, we're gonna just substitute in the definition for M. We're gonna say that M is equal to P sub one times P sub two times P sub three, all the way through P sub N plus one. This is the definition of M minus the product of all of those prime numbers. So minus P sub one, P sub two, P sub three, all the way through P sub N. The products cancel, uh, that subtracted from that is gonna cancel, and what we're left with is that P sub J divides the number one. Okay. And it is at this point right here where we have a contradiction. Because if P sub J divides one, that means that one is an integer multiple of P sub J. In other words, this by definition this tells us that one is equal to some integer c times p sub j. But if c is an integer and p sub j has to be greater than the number one, that's what it means, that's ingrained in the definition of what it means to be prime, right? Then some integer times some integer greater than one is guaranteed to give you a number larger than one. Therefore, at this point, we can say that we have arrived at a contradiction. It is impossible for any prime number to divide the number one. Okay, I just provided the verbal argument for that, but, but you should uh, verify that yourself as well if, if that's confusing. But, but the main idea is that this thing right here is a contradiction. Contradiction. Okay, and because that's a contradiction, that tells us that this initial assumption to assume that P sub J divides M is incorrect. And therefore, regardless of what value of J we have, whether we have P sub one, P sub two, P sub three, regardless of what prime number we're looking at, there's not a single prime number out of all of these supposed N that divide our number M. So what I can say is down here, therefore, for all values of J, P sub J does not divide the number M. Okay? And that was the intermediate result that we're trying to prove. You could almost call that a lemma if you'd like. Okay. Hopefully we're, we're following so far. Let's keep going though, right? Uh, we just showed in the previous whiteboard that any number that is a natural number greater than one can be decomposed as a product of prime numbers. Well, M is a number, right? So M should be able to be decomposed as a product of, of primes. In other words, I should be able to say that M, after I go through the, pro the process of, of decomposing it, I, I should be able to write this as some product, so one times piece of two, all the way through maybe piece of K. It's, it's some product of, of prime numbers. Now, what we just established is that that none of these um, none of these n different prime numbers divide m, but at the same time, m has to be divided by some prime number in order to be a product of these primes. All right. So so what that's telling us is that there is some prime number in here 
and this product that M is composed of. There's some prime number in here that is not in here. So what, what we're really saying is that if we only have N prime numbers, we're missing out on some prime numbers. There need to be some additional prime numbers that could compose this product. So maybe just to, to try to really make it clear, as long as we have a finite number of prime numbers, finitely many prime numbers, there will always, we will always be missing some. And because we will always be missing some prime numbers, for any finitely many, uh, that means the only possible solution then is if there are infinitely many prime numbers. Okay? And, and, and that is really the, the, the crux of the argument for, for, for Euclid's proof for this. Okay, I, I'm not quite sure where to stand, but I'll, I'll stand right here. So hopefully that idea makes sense. Uh, and, and yeah, this is the first of two proofs that we're going to look at. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to erase this and I'm going to write out the second proof, which is done by a guy named Erdos. I believe that's how you pronounce his name, at least. E-R-D-O-S, where there's two little dots on top of the O. All right. So we're going to look at that proof next. All right. So on to Erdos's proof that there are infinitely many primes. Now, I'm just gonna give you a heads up. And in, in my opinion, this proof is a little more detailed than Euclid's proof. So I highly recommend that you utilize the pause button on the video so you can uh, really make sure that you understand each of the steps. Cause it, it definitely took me a little bit longer to understand what was going on than with, with Euclid's proof. But regardless, let's, uh, let's get into it. So Erdos starts with a similar general strategy that, that Euclid did where he's going to perform a proof by contradiction. And he's going to start by assuming that there are only finitely many primes. And maybe we can call these primes P1, P2, and maybe all the way through PK. So there are only K primes in existence. And what, what Erdos wants to start by doing is to say, okay, well, let's, let's see that if we were to take these primes, multiply them together, and raise them to various powers, how many different possible numbers can we get out of these k prime numbers, which are supposedly all of the prime numbers? So, for example, we could take our first prime, P1, and maybe we could square it. We could take our second prime number P2, raise it to the zeroth power, it's allowed. Uh, then we could take our third prime number, P3, and raise it maybe to the fifth. And we could keep on doing this all the way through the final supposed kth prime number, and maybe we'll raise it, I don't know, to the, the first or something like that. All right, so this would be one instance of, of taking each of the k prime numbers raising them to various powers. And when we do that, we're going to get some number as the output. What, what we want to do though, is to, to come up with a notation to describe raising each of these prime numbers to a general power. And to do that, I am going to, I'm going to erase these specific numbered exponents and maybe say that for the first prime number P1, we want to raise it to some generalized power, and maybe I'll call that generalized power j sub one. Then with p sub two, I'll raise that to the j sub two power. Notice that I, I'm putting subscripts on each of these exponents because I might want to raise p two to a different power than what I raised p one to. So I'm gonna need a different notation to say that this exponent might not be the same as that exponent. Otherwise, if we were to call this j and this j and this j and this j, that would be saying that we're raising all of the prime numbers to the same exponent, and we don't necessarily want that. So that's why we have this notation. And we could keep on applying this notation for each of the prime numbers. So p3 can be raised to the j3 power all the way through p sub k, which gets raised to the j sub k power. Okay. And we want to look at all the possible combinations that can be produced from all these different products. 
Now, to, to see how we do that, uh, there's this really cool trick where we're, or not trick, I guess, but this really cool uh, next step where we can take out all of the squares in this product and, and just see what we're left over with. So when we do that, we're going to have some number, which I'll call M, some number squared, which is all of the quantities squared move to the outside. And then we're still gonna have our prime, so P1, P2, all the way through PK. But this time, now they're not gonna be raised to the various J exponents, where I should say that J is greater than or equal to zero. But instead, they're gonna be raised to some new set of exponents, and maybe I'll, I'll call them the I's. So this is the I, I sub one, I sub two, all the way through I sub K. And the reason why we're doing this is, is now there are significantly stricter uh, or, or significantly stronger restrictions on the I exponents as opposed to the J exponents. Uh, the I exponents can only take on the values I equals zero or I equals one, like this, okay? Yeah. Now to, to see what we're doing going from here to here, I, I think it's probably best visualized with a, a short simplified example. So if we have maybe two cubed times three squared as just an example, then in that case, two would be our first prime number, P1, and three would be our second prime number, P2. Then three, the exponent of two, that would be j sub one, and two, the exponent of three would be uh, j sub two. What we are doing, taking this number, which would be representative of this line, and going down to this line, is we are just moving all the squared terms out in front. So to see how we do that, we could rewrite two cubed as two times two squared, and we could write three squared, well that's already squared, so just like three squared. And in this case, we can combine all the squared terms together, so we're gonna get two times three squared, and then we can still have two times three raised to various powers, and we just see what's left over. So after we take care of the two squared and three squared, we still have one power of two, and we have no powers of three. So this would simplify to six squared times two to the one times three to the zero. And now in this case, the number six would be the letter M, or the variable M. That's what this thing is right here. Two and three are still our prime numbers. So two is still prime number one, and three is prime number two. But now notice that the exponents have to take on either the value zero or one. So so this one would be the exponent i1, and this zero would be the exponent i2. So, so starting from this number right here, going down to this number right here, is effectively what we're doing, but just written more generally, going from this line to this line. So hopefully that makes sense. And, and the, the reason why we're doing this again is because we want to be able to write it in a form where it is easier to count how many different possible numbers can be produced of this form, given that there are only k different prime numbers. Okay, let's keep going. Let's say that we have a natural number n, and we're gonna define um, that as kind of just like a, a definition. Or just say we have some natural number n that can be written of this form right here. So it's some number squared times some product of the k primes. Then a condition that we can place on this is that the that m needs to be less than or equal to the square root of n. Okay. We might be saying, well, why? Why is that the case? Well, uh, another way of writing this condition right here, I'll just we, we can just square both sides of the inequality, and, and when we do, we get that m squared is less than or equal to n. In the case where m squared is equal to n, that's when each of the primes is raised to the zeroth power. 
So I1 would be zero, I2 is zero, I3 is zero, all the way through I sub K is equaling zero. And when all of these are raised to the zero, this entire product becomes one, and then we would have that N equals M squared. However, in the case where any one of these I exponents is equal to one rather than zero, now this number is going to be greater than one, which means M squared is going to be less than N. And therefore, M is less than the square root of N. Okay, so for some natural number, uh, this is going to be a condition that is, is placed on that number. Okay, uh, so uh, what this tells us too is that uh, for all the, that, that out of all the different possible values of, of M, at most, so let's say this, at most, there are, they're going to be square root of n different values of m. If we take the, the, the largest part of this inequality, it's either m is gonna be less than square root of n or it's gonna be equal to square root of n. At most, m is gonna be equal to square root of n. So we're gonna have, there are m equals square root of n possibilities. or square root of n different values that m could take on, okay? Uh, and, and that's good too, because that, that now puts a constraint on how many different values we could have right here. So if there are, maybe I'll, I'll just put like a little under bracket or under brace, and I'll just say that there are square root n possibilities from, from that term alone. Now what we have to do is say, okay, if there are square root of n possibilities from this term, how many possibilities can be produced from the remaining terms, from each of these products of primes? And, and, and then we're just going to multiply all of those possibilities together. That's going to give us a total number of possibilities that can be produced for numbers of this form. So starting off with P1 to the I1, there are or hopefully it makes sense that there are going to be two possibilities, either I1 equals zero or I1 equals one. So the two possibilities are going to be P1 to the zeroth power or P1 to the first power. So here there are going to be two possibilities. Let's move on to the next one for P2. Same idea, right? Since I2 can only take on zero or one, this is either going to be P2 raised to the zeroth power or to the first power. So there are two possibilities from here. And hopefully we, we, we see the pattern, right? That for each of these K different prime numbers, there are going to be two possibilities for each of these prime numbers. Like that. So the total number of, uh, how, how do I want to say this without making this a tongue twister? Total amount of possible different numbers of this form is going to be square root n times two times two times two times two k different times. So I'm gonna write total number of possible numbers is just going to be square root of n times two raised to the kth power. Okay. And, and getting to that point is really the first big step in this proof. That that there are at at, at most there are going to be this many different different numbers that can be written in this form right here. Okay, for for a given natural number n. Right. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. I'm going to refer back to my notes now just to make sure that I, I get the, the last part of this right because there's a lot going on. Right. Uh, so let me just check this real quick. Okay, and right, right. So, okay, yeah, this is for a, a arbitrary n. Now, what what we can do is is we can because we kind of just set this n to be some natural number, we can pick it to be larger than a, a very convenient threshold. And and what we're going to do is we can say let's set. Maybe I'll write this now. Let's set n, our natural number n, to be greater than 4 raised to the kth power, like this. 
Uh, so, so whatever our natural number it is, it has to be greater than four to the k, where again, k is the number, the finite, the supposed finite number of prime numbers that, that we have. And when, when, we, when we do this, uh, this is going to, or this constraint is going to relate right here. So let's see, how, how, how should I do this? I can write that n is equal to the square root of n times the square root of n, like that. And now, if, if n is greater than four to the k, then we're gonna have that square root of n should be greater than square root of four to the k, or in other words, four k raised to the one half, which is gonna be equal to the four to the k over two, which this can be written as, four can be written as two squared to the k over two, like that. Uh, the twos are gonna cancel out right there, so that's gonna be two to the k. So, in other words, uh, one of these factors of root n can stay here, and then this square root of n factor is, needs to be greater than two to the k. So what we are inherently showing then is that, that I'm running out of room, that, whoops, <laughs> that n should be greater than two to the k times the square root of n. That's kind of the, the crux of the argument right there. Now, lots going on, right? Uh, we, we've come up with this inequality that n should be greater than two to the k times the, the square root of n. So, so what does this actually tell us though, right? What, what, is this, what does this really mean? Well, th this tells us that, that there are, if this is the supposed maximum number of possibilities, that's what we established right here. Maybe I should write this as the max total. Again, this is the max total because at most there are square root n different possibilities for m. So if this is the supposed maximum number of possible uh, possibilities for different numbers of this form right here, and we're saying that we've found a number n that is greater than the maximum number of possibilities, that means that there is there's, there are additional possibilities that are not accounted for with these k prime numbers. In other words, there, there should be more prime numbers that need to get added in order to account for these, for, for the additional possibilities that are not accounted for in here. And, and that, is, that is where we uh, really get to the infinitely many part, right? Because if, if you could say that, that there should be more than any arbitrary finite number of prime numbers, the only way that can be true is if you have an infinite number of prime numbers. Okay, um, so a lot going on. And again, I, I recommend pausing the video to make sure that we're, we're understanding each of the steps. Because uh, we can see how these, these proofs are starting to get a little more dense, but, but, but still really, really interesting. Okay, now as a final note, and we'll call it here because I, I think this is uh, kind of a step up from, from maybe some of the stuff we were working on. Just want to comment on why, why are we going to go through this seemingly more complicated proof when our friend Euclid already came up with a proof uh, that seemed to be a lot simpler? Why go through the, the, the trouble of, of going through a more complicated proof that gets you to the exact same result? Uh, that might be a question that you have. And I would like to just remind you that if, if this is the thought process you have, uh, one, that's completely understandable. <laughs> but, but, but two, uh, keep in mind that when we have that mindset where we're thinking very much in terms of what's the end goal of, of I just want to prove there are infinitely many, and, and we're, we're starting to lose track of the process. This process is fundamentally different uh, than the process that, that Euclid provided. So it shows us a, a different sort of route that we can take to, to show the, the, the actual statement. And, and if we have tools that we understand from, from this problem or from this proof, 
we can utilize those same tools for other problems. So the benefit of doing this is not necessarily to gain any more knowledge on the overall theorem. We get the same result that there are infinitely many prime numbers, but rather we're learning new tools and new ways of thinking about uh, just about, about ideas and math in general that, that could be useful later on. And that's where the benefit really comes in. For, for example, learning how you could take take some product, some arbitrary product of primes, break them into something like this, and to count the, the total number of possibilities was something I had not thought of before looking at this proof. Um, so hopefully that makes sense and why we're, why I want to show an additional example of, of, of this theorem. And we're gonna continue to do that throughout out the, the video series too, in order to, to really get as many tools in our, our toolkit as possible. That's enough talking, I think. Um, so, so thanks for watching, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back making videos, and the plan is to just keep on doing them whenever I have time. Uh, and, and yeah, thanks for watching. I'll, I'll see you in the next video.